What we're going to do today is present to you uh, what I think is a, a quite amazing tool. Uh, it's a first of a kind. Um, it's a very, very deep and very detailed tool that lets policymakers assess the energy and climate impacts of energy policy. Um, anyone who's labored in this field understands what a core issue energy is to our economy, to our national security, obviously to, for conventional pollutants, for global climate change, um, and, and, and emphatically for the consumer budget. So what we tried to do is develop a tool which does not have biases, there's no thumb on the scale here, which allows a policymaker to select from more than 50 different policies and set each of them individually, which in real time calculates the interactions between policies and which in real time shows you um, the, cl the, climate, the climate impacts and the cost impacts both. It's, it's highly organized, um, and we're putting the entire thing into open source today, including uh, very well organized data tables, full referencing, and complete documentation of the thing. Um, just a couple takeaways, and then I'm going to quickly walk through a, um, a, a PowerPoint, which is awkwardly mounted on the side of the room. Um, the, the first takeaway is that we can achieve quite easily the Clean Power Plan goals and very cost effectively. Um, more so, the goals that the President originally announced in the bilateral agreement with China and then is now our submission to the UNFCCC, which is more aggressive, 26 to 28 percent CO2 reductions by 2025 compared to 2005, also achievable and at a fantastic cost savings. The second takeaway, though, which is crucial, is that it depends, emphatically depends on getting the right mix of policies um, and having the policy properly designed. As we've learned the hard way, there are many more ways to design bad policy than good policy. Um, good policy is an amazing accelerant. Uh, bad policy inhibits technology development, technology deployment, and raises costs for consumers. So that's what we want to what I'm going to talk about briefly today. And then Jeff Rissman, who's a principal architect of the model, is going to show you how the model is working through the web app. So um, if I can crane your necks, I will do this quickly. Um, the first thing we wanted to say is that, is that energy policy should be goal-oriented. You should not fall in love with the technology or a policy type. The things that Americans want are that energy be affordable, clean, safe, and reliable. Um, those are straightforward attributes. Policymakers have as inputs things, the things they can do. For example, a carbon tax or a fuel efficiency standard or an appliance standard or desubsidizing fossil fuels. They have as outputs ultimately these things. And so this is, this is the way the model works. It looks as, at that combination. We, um, we looked across the suite of policies that are, that are done here and we examined internationally best practices and policies and we built this tool in a way to that it's analytically driven and finds the best suite of policies. Uh, because a model like this is a, is a huge endeavor, we employed uh, outside experts on many of these things from three national labs and three universities, and we also did extensive peer review from all of these institutions listed here. Um, the way the model works is it's a replica of the physical economy, and this is very important. The model knows how many trucks there are, for example, and how far they drive, and what kind of mileage they get, and the carbon intensity of the fuel they use, and therefore knows the carbon emissions of today's truck fleet. And then if you change the heavy duty fuel efficiency standard, it knows how many trucks are added to the fleet each year, how many are retired from the fleet each year. And so year by year, you can, you can see the difference on carbon emissions from that fuel efficiency standard for heavy duty trucks. The reason this is important is because unlike many models, this model does not try to predict the future it compares a business as usual future to the one that you've now created by adjusting fuel efficiency standards for trucks or any one of another 50 different policies. Um, it covers all the greenhouse gas sectors, including ag and industry. As I mentioned, uh, it's totally open source and there are two ways in which it's open source. We have a web app that anyone can run, which is live today, uh, and then you can download the programming language, which is called Vensim, which is a system dynamics language, uh, if you really want to get into it and see exactly how every equation and every relationship is laid out. It's laid out like a gigantic flowchart, so you can visually take in what's going on, and every calculated variable in the, fl the flowchart shows you a mini graph 
in real time. Also, the, the model operates in real time, so as soon as you change a policy, you see the output, which we'll see in a sec. This is a, a, a picture of the web app. You're going to see this live, so you don't need to stare at that yet. A quick word on some of the findings. Um, the first thing we did, because there are 50 different policy levers and they interact with each other, you don't add them up. This thing, if you do a fuel efficiency standard for cars and you also do a VMT reduction strategy, you can't add up the results from each. It's, it's the, the total is less than what they would each contribute. So we developed scripts that run uh, this model tens of thousands of times for a given goal to find the best mix of policies to achieve that goal. We did that for the clean power plan. We also did that for the um, national targets of 26 to 28 percent reduction. The upshot is with five policies we can achieve the clean power plan uh, very easily and save consumers a great deal of money along the way. This is the list of policies, which is very modestly accelerating coal plant retirements. In fact, I think retirements are going to exceed this policy number regardless. Um, focusing more on industrial energy efficiency, boosting renewable energy and transmission. This model deals with transmission explicitly. And if you fail to increase transmission as you increase renewable energy, you hit bottlenecks. Very important point there. Building codes and appliance standards and increased R&D. For every one of these policies, we established boundaries that we think are politically realistic and economically realistic and are deeply footnoted and, and resourced. So again, you can set your own choices, um, but the boundaries are, are reasonable within what you can do. It's, it's, it's considerably tougher to achieve an economy-wide reduction of 26 to 28 percent. Um, this, this is the national goal. Um, in order to achieve that reduction, you have to look at every single sector, from ag and forestry to industry to transportation, buildings, and certainly the electricity sector. You also cannot land on a single policy that you might fall in love with. As much as I love Chicago school economics, you can't get there with a carbon tax alone. That's not the way the physical economy works. Carbon tax is essentially, I don't know if meaningless is quite the right word, but it has a very small effect on things like building energy efficiency because the people that design and build buildings never pay the utility bill. Um, the transportation sectors also. So it's not surprising that, to, that the most cost-effective strategy to hit these targets has about 15 policies in there, including, by the way, non-carbon forcers like methane and F gases. Um, again, each of the, this seems like a long list, but we're talking about transforming the entire economy of the world so that it emits a lot less pollution. A couple quick charts here. Um, under Business as usual, and by the way, we used all objective gold standard data like EIA data. Everything's fully available and fully referenced. Um, we didn't invent the BAU. We took this BAU from the, I think it was the annual energy outlook, is that right? Yes. Um, the clean power plan, uh, total emissions are not, they're, they're about 32% reduction in utility emissions, but if you look at the economy as a whole, it's obviously, it's closer to 10% reduction. Um, and then the, <clears throat> The, the suite of policies that hit the, the national target, we call the policy solutions model. So we develop packages of, as I mentioned before, policies that achieve these numbers. This is a wedge chart which shows you how you achieve the economy-wide reductions. These are very significant reductions. Um, the purple is a carbon tax. It's important. The others are sector specific. And for each sector, we have uh, uh, quite a bit of detail on, what, on, on, on what's entailed. Let me wind this up quickly with a, a discussion of the economics. When you invest in more efficient or cleaner capital stock, you incur near-term capital expenses, which are, if they're properly done, offset over time by reduced fuel expenditures. Um, and so not surprisingly, it costs money in the, in the early years to pay for this capital stock, and you regain it in the later years as your equipment burns less and less fuel. What we discovered in strictly economic benefits, if you use the optimum suite of policies, is that there's about $600 billion on the table available for the economy by 2030, cumulative in the economy-wide strategy. Um, and, and that the clean power plan itself is also economically positive by 2026. Um, that doesn't count social benefits. The social benefits here are reduced mortality and reduced morbidity. Uh, and these are done with statistical value of life calculations and detailed uh, exposure assessments. <clears throat> Those numbers turn out to be quite a bit larger than the direct economic impacts. Of course, there's no cash flow with these numbers, but there's certainly human value 
associated with them. And then when you add them up, it's a bonanza. Uh, the, the numbers are very good. And again, there's no thumb on the scale here. Every single one of these policies and every technology is driven by transparent analytics. And, and again, you can adjust them as you wish. So I'm going to wrap up this bit and let, Joe, and let Jeff show you how the model works. Um, but the upshot, as I said at the beginning, we can win the carbon race. The incredible price reductions of new technologies make this feasible. The advances in system integration can alleviate problems with reliability. The right suite of policies is crucial, and designing them correctly is crucial. And I'll, I got a couple of quick words on that. Um, and if, again, if we do it properly, we save a lot of money. Here's the last bit I want to offer to you. We looked at policies at a lot of different countries. And energy policy, as I said at the beginning, has more modes of failure than success. So we tried to identify what are the characteristics that define success. Um, the first one is that you need to reward performance, not investment. Uh, we've seen very many examples of things like, for years, California had an investment tax credit for windmills. So you could build a windmill and make money even if it never turned. You're incenting the wrong thing. You don't want to incent capital deployment. You want to incent kilowatt hours produced. You don't want to incent capacity either, which is what they did in China. A lot of capacity was built, not hooked up, not useful, right? So reward performance, not investment. The second is one has to unleash, this is no surprise to anyone, market forces and innovation to achieve goals. Almost every environmental standard that's a performance standard, like the sulfur dioxide standards in America, have been hit at a tiny fraction of the projected price because it engenders good technological dynamics, especially if you have a long-term signal to get there. A third, a third one, and this one is mostly missing, is to have continuous improvement in your performance requirements. The Japanese have a really neat policy. It's called the top runner. They take a snapshot of everything in the economy every four years. So refrigerators. They take the top quintile of performers and make that the new floor for the next four years. They do it with trucks. They do it with motors. They do it with lighting. It's a huge incentive for companies to get into the top quintile. And by the way, if you're not there, you're going to have a little trouble the year after that because you're not going to be selling your products. So continuous improvement is a bonanza. And the, the example I like to use in America, the negative example, is the first fuel efficiency standards were signed into law by President Gerald Ford in 1974. We doubled fuel efficiency from 13 miles per gallon to almost 26 in 1985. And then they more or less plateaued. There were a couple increments, but not enough, all the way till the early days of the Obama administration. And then they're, now they're going to be doubled again. That plateau cost us over a trillion dollars, which we sent to countries that don't like us very much, right? If instead, President Ford had said, these standards will automatically increment at 3% a year, the way the California Building Code does, the way the Japanese top runner does, we would have saved that money. And we would have also probably avoided bankrupting our auto industry, because everybody else was moving ahead rapidly with their technology. So continuous improvement is a policy design principle that's crucial. And then finally, setting a long-term trajectory is important. We're talking big stuff when you turn over the power plants, rebuild the factories, rethink ag. And if you have two year at a time policy or year at a time policy and budgeting, you're going to waste vast amounts of capital. You're going to fail to build the right kinds of R&D. You're going to forego a huge suite of technological improvements you could otherwise have. Um, we've, we've separately produced a report on how to design policies to capture these, these uh, characteristics.